it took me a while to understand that um, I wasn't the one that died. She was. Welcome to the third season of Heart to Heart with Michael, a program for the bereaved community. Our purpose is to empower our community with resources, support, and advocacy information. In this season, we're going to be taking a longer view of grief. Can we find peace and healing? Is there a way to move on despite our losses? What about the guilt some of us feel, even just thinking about moving forward in a life without someone we loved and cared for? We're fortunate today to have Peter Puglisi on our program. Our program today is called Moving On Is Not Moving Away. It takes a look at a widower who lost his wife 10 years ago and is now starting a new chapter in his life. Peter Puglisi met his wife, Linda, when he was 19. He knew almost immediately that she was the one for him, and she must have felt likewise because after dating for only three months, she said yes to his proposal. They had a great marriage and have two lovely daughters who are now 31 and 24 and are the pride of his life. Linda developed breast cancer at age 43. The doctors gave her one year to survive, but she was a fighter and lived for six more years. When Linda died, Peter felt that a part of it had died too. He was devastated. If it wasn't for his girls, Peter says he would have died that day as well. All of that happened 10 years ago, and today Peter will talk with us about how he views grief, how Linda prepared her daughters for her demise, and how Peter continues to celebrate Linda today while moving forward with his own life. Peter, thank you for coming to Heart to Heart and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. When we were talking with you earlier, you told me that you never get over it, that 10 is just a number. But tell me what you meant by that. Well, it's um, it's pretty much like it, it's always with you. I mean, she's always with me. Um, I relive that day mm-hmm. um, numerous times over and over again, especially uh, like after the holidays, you know, things like that. Um, you don't get over the loss. You just learn to live with it. And 10 years, 20 years, it's not going to really be a difference. What's that like when you come home and, and, and she's just not there? An empty feeling. Um, I do have two dogs that um, are great company. Um, mm-hmm. They're always happy to see you. <laughs> Best but um, it's, it's like um, sometimes, you know, you walk in the door and almost expect to see her standing there. Still. And then, uh, yeah, and then you realize that that's not going to happen. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do was what, um, actually Linda's grandmother had done, um, they would, uh, he would, she would come home and expect to see him and then not see him. And then the way she dealt with it was when she was in the kitchen, he was in the dining room. Mm. And when she was in the dining room, he was in the kitchen. So in her mind, he was still there and that's how she dealt with it. And I've tried to do that a lot myself. I like that. I like that. It sort of keeps everything active and alive. It's just in progress the whole time. What's the hardest part of continuing without Linda? The holidays, you know, the way she used to decorate the house and <laughs> that's not there anymore. And the idea that um, pretty much, I mean, I got cheated. We got cheated because um, she shouldn't have been gone so early. Um, mm-hmm. We still had many years that we should have had together. It's interesting that you say that because when my daughter was dying, we had this conversation, my son and I, and that he believed that with his faith, he was going to make things right, that somehow this was wrong. And I said to him that that's okay for you, but I think that things tend to work out the way they're supposed to. And so I was moving directly towards acceptance even before she had completely left us. How do you feel about that? Do you think that things work out the way they should? Um, I think everybody, you know, feels differently and believes what comforts them. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really believe in a master plan. I don't really believe, you know, things are meant to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, I really believe it's just a, you know, a crapshoot, excuse my French, but, um, really? I, you know, it's, it's what comforts you is what you want to think about and believe in. Um, you know, people say, well, you'll see her again. You know, I hope that's true, but you know, I can't, you know, I can't live my life thinking that I just have to accept the fact that she's gone. Yeah, I think that's true. Until somebody actually comes back and taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, how are you? I don't know that I'm going to see Mm -hmm. anybody. And I I mean, just as you said, I'd love to. I think we'd all love to. And we all sometimes make ourselves see things and hear things. But I I, I think it's a good idea to sort of collect yourself and, and find a way to move forward. 
Right. And given that no two people are the same, but we all go through similar experiences, what advice would you give to somebody who's just lost his or her spouse? Ten years on, what are you thinking? Well, one of the biggest things that I did wrong in the beginning was I felt guilty. Mm. Um, because, I, you know, I fixed a lot of things and I couldn't fix that. Mm. But um, looking back, I probably would have, um, you know, opened up a little bit sooner than I did. Mm. You know, my kids gave me, you know, came, gave me one of those we need to talk speeches. And um, they said, you know, we're worried about you. You don't go out. You don't do anything. You sit home. You come home from work and you sit home with the dogs. Mm-hmm. So um, they got me to start dating, believe it or not. And, wow. you know, it was like, you know, mommy wouldn't want you to be alone, you know, all of that. And the first time I took someone out to dinner, I felt so guilty. Like, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. You know, I. I I was, you know, loyal all the way through our relationship, but I was like, oh. this is wrong. Mm. And it took me a while to understand that um, I wasn't the one that died. She was. Mm. And I'll always love her and she'll always be with me. But, um, you know, you have to move on. And it takes, you know, everybody grieves differently and everybody moves on differently. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's whatever, you know, no one can judge anyone else on, oh, you're grieving too long or you should, go, you know, it's whatever the person feels. We've talked a lot about that on this program, what other people tell you. People shouldn't be judgmental. You know what I'm saying? And I think right. that um, people tell you, well, isn't it enough time? You know, have you been through this? Did you marry my wife or your wife? You know, it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Really not. Well, people love to tell people what to do. I mean, that's just the nature of people. I mean, no, don't tell someone how to live your life and don't tell someone how to deal with grief. Everybody does it differently. Well, that's completely true. Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Michael's program, please email him at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to our program. Peter, tell us how Linda prepared the girls for her demise. Well, it was harder for the younger one than it was for the older one because my younger one was 14, my older one was 21. But they spent a lot of time together when she went on the past. Um, they spent a lot of time together um, going to day trips, doing things together. Um, you know, they talked a lot. Um, again, it was harder for the younger one because, um, you know, for Chris, because, um, you know, she she was a young girl and, and needed her mother. And um, but she did. You know, try and teach her a lot of things, and they spent an awful lot of time together and uh, making memories. Making memories was the best way I could describe it. Did you know what they were talking about? Most of the time, but I, I did. You know, I, what I would try and do was I would try and I used to call it Linda time. Mm-hmm. I would let you know them be with Linda, and I would be working on the car or cutting the grass or whatever, working another second job, so they can have their time, their quality time together without feeling like that, um, you know, I was interrupting or whatever. Um, and I think it helped them a lot because they do have a lot of good memories. You told me that you spent a lot of time working while Linda was sick so that she could have a lot of mother and daughter time with the girls. Tell us about that time and, and the decision to let Linda create those special memories with the girls. And what were you doing on the side? How were you handling the time that you were not being with them? Well, it, it, I gotta be honest with you. It was tough. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, sometimes you feel kind of left out, you know, but I knew the purpose of it and I kept trying to stay focused on that. Um, you know, we live on Long Island. It's very expensive here. So I didn't want Linda to have to um, work any longer hours or anything. So I, <clears throat> I took a second job and 
um, I would do side jobs. I would uh, install flooring, uh, whatever I could to make extra money so that took the financial burden away. Um, the other problem was a lot of it when Linda was sick, um, the um, insurance companies in their infinite wisdom get involved with the care. And mm-hmm. um, there was this one injection, and I, I don't remember the name of it, but basically when she would go for her chemo, um, there was um, a shot that, they, that the doctors wanted to give her because her blood counts would go low. Right. And the insurance company decided that they didn't want to pay for it. And then if her did, blood counts did go low, she would have to get a blood transfusion after the fact. Right. And that was not acceptable to me. So right. we both made a decision and we decided to, all right, fine, we'll pay for it ourselves. And we did. And it was like $1,500 a shot. Oh my gosh. But at the same point, you know, the, the, the money wasn't the question. The question was, how do I get the money? So I would do anything I could to earn money besides my regular job uh, to take that pressure off. And I didn't want some accountant and some, no, no offense to accountants. <laughs> I didn't want some accountant somewhere in an office deciding on, you know, Linda's health care. Sure. Um, sure. And that was, that was a big decision that we both made together and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Sure. You know, sure. that was not something that, um, I didn't think that was an option. I thought, well, I'm not, I don't want her getting blood transfusions. She's getting weaker that way and then getting, you know, the whole the, the swing of everything. Sure. So we decided to do that. And also, you know, they would go on day trips and things like that. And, you know, the money for that came from there. So, you know, it was very important. But, um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm glad they had the time. I can see that they do things the way she did and they use some phrases that she did and, a lot of times we'll talk about things and um, they'll bring up memories and, and it's, it's, it's nice to see that, that they still have that. Um, so yeah, it was all, it was all something I would do again. Do you think this helped your girls to develop into adulthood with a different kind of outlook on life? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, both my girls are, are uh, strong willed. Um, they know what they want and they go after it. Um, they live life to the fullest. I'll give you an example. My older daughter has been to more countries, um, like 10 times more countries than I've ever been to. Mm-hmm. You know, she wants to live life today because there's always that question mark about tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're both very strong willed. Their, their, their work ethics, um, they took both, both after me and my wife. They're fearless. Mm-hmm. They, um, you know, they'll do things where, you know, a lot of people say, well, oh, that's not the safest thing to do. But if they want to do it, they're going to find a way to go do it. Are they skydiving? Don't let them do that. It's a silly thing. Uh, they've already done that. People should not skydive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not crazy about getting in a plane and then getting out of it, let alone jumping out of a perfectly good plane. That's not exactly. Today. Exactly. But they, 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 they've swam with sharks. They've skydived. Oh, and it's not like they have a death wish. But they see these things and, you know, with the Internet and television and everything today, I mean, you'd see everything everywhere. So they see these things. Oh, that would look interesting. And then, you know, they, they want to try and do it. So, I mean, I give them credit. But at the same time, I, you know, like when they do these things, like, don't tell me till it's over. I don't know when you're going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want to know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, but um, but they have a, a zest for life. And, and, and I love that about them because, you know, they look forward to tomorrow but they have no regrets. Well, you were telling me earlier before we taped that uh, they're both in medical careers. So what does, what are they doing now? And the choice of their medical career, does that have something to do with their mom? Um, No, not really. I mean, my older daughter, Angela, she is a registered nurse and she is going for her um, nurse practitioner's license. Mm -hmm. And my younger daughter, Chris is in her last um, semester at Rutgers Mm-hmm. Um, she is in a doctorate program for physical therapy. Nice. Um, neither of them really did it because they want to help people. Um, so maybe in a sense, yes, it was because of Linda, but at the same point, um, they know they're both people, pers- people, people, if that makes sense. Yes. And they want to, you know, they do want to help people and this is ways that they can help people. I mean, um, they're both very demanding careers and, um, yeah. I give them credit because, um, they're, they're really on top of their game and, um, and they've both worked very hard. So, um, I don't say it was because of Linda, you know, with the cancer or anything, but I think it was possibly because of helping people. I just, I want to, uh, go out of this section on a, on a, on a happier note. Um, your older daughter, 
was recently married. Yes. Was that like dad? <laughs> um, it's it's different. I mean, um, she's been on her own for a while, um, but it's um it's it's nice because the family is growing that way. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you know, I mean, now I have a a, a grand dog, a grand puppy, <laughs> um, but I'm still waiting for the grandchild, and that will be nice um, because then I can spoil him and give him back. Oh, it'll be great. Um, <laughs> it'll be great. But we kid around. We kid around about it because she's like, "Oh, you know, you're gonna watch the baby every day, right?" No. <laughs> and no. I'm like, "Yeah, I'll watch it. I'll watch him from you know afar, and uh, you know." <laughs> but um, hand back spoiling, to you when it's wet. right? Ho- spoiling him or her is going to be the pleasure <laughs> of everything. And then I get to tell her, like, I remember when you did, you know, when she complains about, "Oh, the baby did this and the baby did that," I'll be like. Yep, I remember when you did that, you know, and then I can tell her the <laughs> stories, even though she probably won't remember them. Oh, you're going to thrill her. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. And then, um, you know, my son-in-law, um, he's my son-in-law. I mean, you know, he started calling me dad, um, oh. which which felt good. good. Um, he used to call me Pete. So, you know, that that that's um, that's a warm feeling. I mean, he's, um, you know, he's here a lot to help me out if I need something, help with doing something or a project or whatever, uh, you know, so it's great, you know, um, now I have three kids instead of That's two. wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. If you've enjoyed listening to this program, please visit our website, heartsunitetheglobe.org, and make a contribution. This program is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to educate, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at congenitalheartdefects.com. For information about CHD, hospitals that treat CHD survivors, summer camps for CHD families, and much, much more. I was five hours old when I had my first surgery. Wow. The only advice I can really give someone like that is to be there for your family. This is life and you have two choices. You either live it or you sit in a corner and cry. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of Heart to Heart with Anna. Join us on Tuesdays at noon Eastern Time on Spreaker, our blog talk radio. We'll cover topics of importance for the congenital heart defect community. Remember, my friends, you are not alone. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our program, please send an email to Michael Lieben at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Michael. Peter, this season our theme is about healing and coming to a sense of peace with your loss. Can you tell us how you feel you've been able to heal and achieve peace? Linda had certain wishes. Um, You know, her parents were older and we've been dealing with the illness for a long time. So Linda didn't want to put them, me to put them through a wake and a funeral and all that. So what we did instead, um, she was cremated in a private, uh, you know, private thing. And then what we did was um, I rented out the hall at the firehouse in Plainview. And we invited everyone and anyone who wanted to be there. And we had a, um, a celebration of life instead of a wake and, and so forth. And we invited people if they wanted to come up and speak and say anything about Linda they wanted to and how they knew her. And, and we had people coming up and saying some nice stories about how they knew her. And most of what we wanted to hear was um, good things, memories about her life and, mm-hmm. um, you know, things that, you know, people she knew and, you know, how she, she used to... Um, go up to the school she used to, every friday she would go to the school and she would do a, pay, a pizza sale because mm-hmm. they were raising money for um for um uh, pta and for the music program and things like that mm-hmm. and the people that knew her there and you know so it was it was more of a you know this was linda and you know we were happy to have known her right. as opposed to you know oh we have a loss and we're grieving um and Mm. Um, I think that was uh, that was actually a good thing to do because I know that my mother-in-law to this day talks about how a positive thing it was instead nice. of such a negative thing like a weight. Right. Yeah, sure. Of course, my father-in-law didn't understand it, and he was complaining that the coffee wasn't right and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. But that was just my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. find after ten years that 
the bad parts of the memory, the difficult moments have sort of faded away. And so whenever you think of Linda now, she's you, she's there and you smile because you only remember really good moments. Do you find that? Well, yes. I mean, um, time does have a way of, like I said, filtering out the bad and remembering the good. I mean, the bad memories are always there and they're deep inside me. And, um, you know, something might come up where it'll trigger it. But for the most part, memories are the good memories. Yeah. Like I said, you know, her decorating the house for Christmas or her baking the cookies or a family vacation we went on or, you know, um, you know, like she used to do with the kids. Um, every Father's Day, she used to do um, a little skit with the kids. Oh, nice. And she would wake me up on Father's Day and I'd sit at the table in the backyard and the kids would go through their little skit. And it's just like, you know, I'll, I'll remember that as long as I live, you know, and uh, and the kids remember it, too, which is good. It's more positive than me- the negative, but like I'll walk into something like that. I'll walk into a hospital oh, yeah. um, and I see somebody, uh, you know, in, in a room that's hooked up to everything, you know, that kind of yeah, triggers jack- those memories, too. That'll jolt you back, sure. I I haven't seen you, I think, since we were 12 years old, but I can absolutely see you sitting at the head of the table holding court while they put on skits for dad. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely see that. That is is so perfect with the Peter Puglisi I knew in fourth grade. Yeah. We talked about moving on is not moving away, and you shared with me that you have someone new in your life. Can you tell me about her? Yeah. Um, Her name is Janet, and uh, it's a quick, funny story, um, but it's worth telling. Um, You know, we talked about how I don't think there's a master plan, but it's just sometimes the way things work out. Mm -hmm. We went to high school together. Oh my gosh. Um, it's not like we were close friends in high school. We knew each other, but, you know, in, to say hi or something, that was about it. We, I think we had a couple of classes together. But um, we recently did our 40th anniversary of our graduation. Yeah. And we had a reunion, and we both were on the, the committee. And we, you know, working together, you know, for a year on this committee, we got friendlier and closer. And then um, it just happened, you know. And then, um, it was amazing because, you know, like I said, you know, I hadn't seen her in 40 years. Um, and it was just amazing how that got, you know, and, you know, we have a lot of the same interests and everything. And she's a wonderful person. She's generous and she's kind. And um, she's just, you know, I can't say enough about her. How is she um, with the kids? And uh, she's great. I mean, uh, the kids love her. I mean, give you an idea how, how she is. Um, Angela just got married. And um, when my other daughter, Chris, was doing the, the um, bridal shower, um, she was wanted to do all of these, you know, decoration type things and things like that. And Janet is very creative and she stepped in and um, nice. she did, you know, most of it. And, um, you know, which was great for Chris also because Chris didn't have the kind of time because she was in school. So it worked out really well, but that's the kind of person she is. And then, um, you know, for the wedding, she did the same thing with, with um, the place cards or whatever. Angela wanted, she had a, a, a beach theme and she wanted it. Um, she was going to have them made up on seashells. Janet said, wait a minute, I can do that. And oh, wow. I don't know how much money she saved, but they were just <laughs> beautiful. I mean, they looked professional. So that's the kind of person she is. She knows that, you know, she's not here to replace her um she's following her right and there's a big difference and it's not just terminology there's a big difference because sure like i said there is no competition sure you can't give up you can't lose what you had but you can have something new exactly exactly and we'll make new memories and we are we're doing a lot of work we're spend a lot of time together and um it's just great it's just great i mean if you would have asked me 10 years ago would i uh feel this way about another woman and be in this kind of a relationship I would have said you're crazy, uh-huh. but I have moved on and I have healed to a point where I understand this relationship and, and I understand the relationship I had with Linda and the two are mutually exclusive. It's not one against the other. It's that was then. And this is now she'll always be with me. The relationship will always be with me. But, you know, like my kids said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm still a relatively young guy and I shouldn't be alone. And, it's great that I found someone that feels like me and we can have that kind of relationship. You know what? I, I think you deserve that. I think you've suffered enough. I really do. I mean, all of us who've suffered loss, you know, we all have something to say about it. We all have something to say mm-hmm. about each other's loss. But I think 
you know, you deserve a break. I think you deserve something good to happen to you. And you, and and not taking away your kids are wonderful, okay? And and mm-hmm. your daughter getting married is wonderful, and your son in law is wonderful. But you deserve something for you. You deserve something. You just need that. I think it's totally Thank okay. You. You're welcome. Thank you. I now, appreciate you saying that. I want to ask you one more thing. It, it <clears throat> seems incongruous to you that you could have that you could have a life with someone new, considering just a few years ago, ten years ago, Linda died, and you said you wanted to die with her. There was nothing left for you. What would you tell other people? who are now in that in-between. They're after a loss. They are moving forward slowly, and they're considering maybe moving on with somebody else. What do you tell them? First of all, don't make snap decisions and snap, you know, knee-jerk reactions to things. Um, give things time. Mm-hmm. Um, next week or the week after, you're going to see a little clearer than you do now. Right. Um, sure. You know, I had um, children that I had a responsibility to take care of, and I stepped up to that responsibility. Um, and they got me through a lot. Um, but at the same point, you know, you have to look to the future because mm-hmm. it hurts the most it does right now. Tomorrow, it's still going to hurt, and it's always going to be a little hurt. But you're going to learn to deal with it, and then you're going to learn to live life again. You know, you're not the person that died that person that you lost is the person that died and you still have a life to live. And, you know, you can have a night, you can have a happy life. You can enjoy your, your life. Um, just give it a chance. You know, things will happen. Things will get a little better. And that's so true. It's so true. We, we sometimes, you know, we, we grieve so heavily for the person we've lost. We realize we don't realize right away that we're grieving in part for ourselves. Part of us is gone. A part of us is oh, going yeah. to now change in a way that we don't know what's coming. And the unexpected, the unknown is very, very scary, especially when you're older. I think that's a lot of the reason why um, older people, when I say older, older than us, um, people in their <laughs> 70s and 80s, when they lose a spouse, they don't last very long because they can't look forward anymore because they've, they're at a point in their lives where, you know, it's, it's already done. And I think a lot of times you feel like, you know, person one person dies and weeks later or months later, the other part of the couple dies too. Yeah, a lot. You just have to take things as they come and you have to be open to the possibility that you are still going to live. Whether you feel right. that way or not at the, at the moment, you're still going to live and you have an obligation to live and you still have family that needs you. And whatever you can do to keep you going is a good thing because that's what people are built for. That's what we do. Reach out to people doesn't mm-hmm. have to be a, a, a professional. If you can go right. to a professional, that's fine. But reach out to people. Reach out to family members. Reach out to close friends. Reach out to people that you can talk to. Mm-hmm. And you won't feel that they're judging you. They're just there to listen and to help you through it. Well, Peter, thank you very much for joining us. Michael, thank you for having me. Um, I hope this helps other people uh, I'm sure it will. to be able to deal with it. And um not that I have all the answers, but, you know, the experience I've been through has taught me a lot. And if it helps someone, that's great. And that concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Michael. I want to thank Peter Puglisi for sharing his experiences and his advice with us. Please join us at the beginning of the month for a brand new podcast. I'll talk with you soon. And please remember, moving forward is not moving away. Thank mm-hmm. you so, so much. I want to tell you something. Michael, thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you now when we're almost 60 because we were a lot different when we were 12. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have gained strength from listening to our program. Heart to Heart with Michael can be heard every Thursday at noon Eastern time. We'll talk again next time when we'll share more stories. There is no better way to enjoy Heart to Heart with Michael than to snuggle up in your Heart to Heart with Michael sweatshirt while enjoying your favorite warm beverage in a Heart to Heart with Michael mug. You can order yours now from the Hearts Unite the Globe online store at www.hug-podcastnetwork.com. 